but it's still uh, an honorary PhD. <laughs> so, um, but let's let's talk about Ukraine and and what's going on there. I I had a an eye popping. I was in Germany over the weekend, and um, one of the uh, German newspaper, I think it was uh, uh, Der Bild, one of the German newspapers had an interesting article on the front page about how the uh, and correct me if I misunderstood this, because my German, I, I, I used to be fairly good. I lived in Germany back in 86 and 87, but I never studied it in school. And, and so it's Nordstrassendeutsch, uh, you know, that's just street German. Um, but my understanding of this article was basically that the, uh, the, the industrial complex in the cities in the east part of Ukraine are almost exclusively military industrial complex types of facilities that they manufacture mostly weaponry for the Russian military and that in fact there are several major Russian pieces of military equipment, a, a jet and a missile as I recall, that literally the Russians can't make without the factories in the eastern part of Ukraine. Do I have that right? More or less, but could I, since you mentioned Germany, could I mention that we're living through um, an astonishing and shameful moment before we begin. Please. Uh, last Sunday, April 20th, there appeared on the front page of the New York Times a report by Peter Baker, uh, which reported, and this is the astonishing news or the historic news, <clears throat> that President Obama, because of the Ukrainian crisis, has given up any hope of dealing in a positive way with Russian President Vladimir Putin. I read that piece. And therefore, therefore, President Obama has adopted a new strategy, as Baker calls it, a new policy, which is no longer to try to cooperate with Russia, but to treat Russia as a pariah state. And in this pursuit, to adopt or readopt, and this is the word that was reported and used, a policy of containment. Now, containment was, of course, the 45-year American policy during the preceding Cold War. Therefore, it seems right to say that this week, as we talk now, we, the United States, are now officially in a declared Cold War with Russia. Assuming that this article, when I, I read the article yeah. as an op-ed, and I... Uh, well, wait a minute, no, Tom, it appeared on the front page of the paper. Okay, I, I read it on my phone. Well, Sorry. On the front page of the Times, Okay. column left is at the top. Yeah. Uh, Baker is uh, a very authoritative reporting voice at the Times. Uh, probably is their lead political reporter when it comes to Washington. But more importantly, there was not one word of denial or revision nor has there been for the last three days from the White House. So we have to assume that Baker got the gist of the revised policy and discussion in the White House correct. Now, the other half of that, and this is what made me uh, think of Germany and your visit there. In Germany today, for various reasons, there is a full political media debate about the Ukrainian crisis. And who, Russia, Europe, or the United States, bears most responsibility for it. And therefore, great uncertainty about what Western policy should be. That's democracy working. In yeah. the United States, there has not been one public word from any member of our media political establishment, Republican, Democratic, reactionary, progressive, not a word in the mainstream. Now, by mainstream, I mean <clears throat> those publications and those radio shows and those uh, uh, broadcasts that our policy elite reads and watches, shapes, and is shaped by it. Mm. And there you have either full-throated cheerleading, uh, look at, most any Washington Post, New York Times, Wall Street Journal, Fox, CNN, MSNBC, full-throated support for this new militarization of relations with Russia, or silence. So I think future historians will look back and say two things, if there are any future historians, because there's going to be an arms race now. Um, 
One, this is the week that the United States officially declared Cold War on Russia, though it's been unfolding for 20 years. And two, uh, the so-called democratic American bipartisan political system was absent. Uh, it's a shameful day, a shameful week, and there are people such as yourself. Uh, there's uh, John Batchelor on ABC. There's Democracy Now. Uh, there are important broadcasts <clears throat> that put on alternative Voices, dissenting voices. But if they impact the mainstream, policy mainstream, it's only over a long period of time. And by then, as we see now, a long time is too late. So that's where we stand today. And meanwhile, of course, we are sending NATO troops, American troops too, deeper into Eastern Europe. Uh, it's not a large force, 175 paratroopers, as reported also in the Times today, but elsewhere into Poland, uh, Latvia, Lithuania, mm -hmm. Estonia, on Russia's borders. Right. Uh, it's not really clear how many they'll be all together yet, but there's symbolic importance. And in Poland the, is the big, the big concern. Well, Poland is the big one. And, of course, nobody pays any attention to what President Putin says, but he discussed all this at length in the last two weeks. And he says if this keeps up, there's no way we can avoid a new uh, nuclear arms race. He was referring at that moment to American warships sailing in and out of the Black Sea in range of Russia carrying anti-missile any, any missile devices, anti-ballistic missile devices, which Russia interprets as a threat to deprive it of its nuclear deterrence. Therefore, in all likelihood, Russia will begin to deploy and build more of those so-called intermediate-range missiles which were the only category of nuclear weapons ever abolished, for all Obama's talk about this. And they were abolished, of course, by Gorbachev and Reagan in 1987, I think. They are coming back. Wow. Wow. Now, this article that I read in Germany, the, my, my takeaway from it was that it was almost like they were saying Russia needs these eastern Ukrainian cities to to make their weapons, and therefore maybe we should not be so quick to jump in and, and, and be so rigid about these borders or, or uh, you know, whatever. I mean, it was like, this is an issue we need to seriously consider. I've heard no discussion like that in the United States. But what if that's the purpose of Western policy, to deprive Russia of its military industrial base in Ukraine? Oh, my then, God. Then you would say, is it successful or not? Then I'd say the neocons have won. Uh, oh, they have won. What we're living with now are the, are, are the consequences. But the neocons aren't just Republicans. Right. They're Democrats. Sure, sure. Yeah, they are tr totally transparent. We'll be back with more of Professor Mr. Cohen. If we have entered into a new uh, Cold War with Russia, what does that mean? How does that change the average life of America? I, you know, I, I remember the old Cold, Cold War. I'm old enough to remember duck and cover. Um, you know, I remember all the, the demagoguery. I remember the, you know, the, all the tax money going to the nuclear missiles and all that kind of stuff. But um, what, what will that mean this time? Well, when I saw this coming back in February, uh, I uh, called a friend down in uh, the small town in Kentucky where I grew up and asked him uh, if the uh, nuclear fallout shelter that my father had built back in the 1950s, was still functioning. I just, oh, the cat and I may, might exile ourselves in Kentucky. Mm. Uh, that's a joke to remind us that my generation and yours, I'm probably a generation older than you. I'm, I'm 60, 63. Well, uh, I was born in 51. It, it, it depends on, we consider generation 20 years, political generation. Right. So we would be of the same generation, but I'm older than you. Okay. But we both remember, that's the point, and, and my grown children remember Mm. what it meant to grow up during the Cold War. Uh, on a personal level, we lived with the anxiety of nuclear war. Uh, on a, as a nation, we lived with expenditures that gutted our social progress. Mm -hmm. uh, we lived with a po international politics that, that corrupted our domestic politics. Mm -hmm. uh, but I would say, I, not only what I say it, I insist that this new Cold War, if it's allowed to develop, and it's hard to see how it can be stopped now because... Whatever we think of Putin, whatever we think of him, there is zero leadership coming out of the White House. Uh, if it develops, it will be more dangerous, more dangerous,
by which I mean more apt to lead to actual war, conventional or nuclear, than was the last Cold War, for two reasons. The epicenter of the last Cold War was rather far from Russia, in Berlin, divided Berlin. This Cold War is right on Russia's borders in Ukraine, and not only on its borders, but through the heart, to the extent that Ukraine is divided, as it is, through the heart of Russia's traditional historical Slavic civilization. So this is an open wound that you can't put a Band-Aid on, unlike Berlin, unlike Eastern and Central Europe. The other reason is, and I probably remember this better than you do, um, during the last Cold War, the 45-year Cold War, rules of stabilizing behavior developed, particularly after the Cuban Missile Crisis, when both sides, Soviet and America, realized that the other had red lines, that the other and each dare not cross for fear of launching uh, real war. So we went into the business of back-channel communications. We negotiated a lot of treaties that required uh, informing each other about troop movements. There was the, the hotline was installed. So a whole series of kind of gossamer world of stabilizing uh, behavior and mechanisms were created. None of that exists now. Hmm. None of it exists. And what will, if, if, if you read, I read only the Russian and the American press. Both are so full of Im- misinformation that when I finish my daily two hours reading of the press, I am so angry because it would take two weeks to correct what appears, whether it's in a Russian newspaper or the New York Times, particularly in the opinion columns. Yeah, yeah, to untangle it all. We're talking with Professor Stephen Cohen. He's, uh, he writes for the uh, contributing editor to thenation.com and uh, Professor Emeritus at NYU and Princeton.com for his writings, of course. Professor Cohen, uh, we were just talking about what might this new Cold War look like and, and what we both remembered from our childhood, our, our younger years. The, 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 probably the seminal event of my uh, teenage years was... Uh, a proxy war that was part of the Cold War, which was Vietnam. Um, what are your thoughts on, first of all, do you think that that's a, a reasonable analysis of what Vietnam was? And, and, and secondly, uh, it, might we be looking at that sort of thing, where we're going to Russia, we're going to war with Russia, but we're not really going to war with Russia, and it's happening someplace else, uh, you know, maybe right. someplace but, in um, Africa. We've already had one example of that. And we don't have to be older guys, senior citizens, which you're not quite, uh, to remember it. Bless you. In 2008, uh, everybody think back to 2008. It wasn't that long ago. Uh, there was a war, a brief war, uh, in the former Soviet Republic of Georgia between the Russian army and the Georgian army, an army that had been created, uh, armed, and minded by the United States. Uh, that was surely a proxy war. I wrote about it at the time, and I called it the American-Russian proxy war. <laughs> the reason that's relevant now is that it was there in Georgia that the United States and NATO crossed one of the two declared lines, red lines of Russia, that is, taking Georgia into NATO. That's what that was all about. And Russia put a stop to that then. Uh, now, Moscow believes that the United States and NATO have crossed the other and far more important red line in Ukraine. Uh, So might we see a proxy war in Ukraine? Now, if you can allow me one moment of self-advertisement, I have at thenation.com my most recent article. It's called Cold War Again, Who is Responsible? And there I set out the history leading up to this new Cold War. And I argue it's not the official history or narrative we're getting in the mainstream. You've got to see the other guy's side of the story, the Russian side of the story. And the Russian side of the story is that we've been coming at him with NATO for 20 years, began with Clinton, the expansion, and now there's an assault, a march for the, the, you know, the brass ring, the great prize, Ukraine. Now, what might that mean, to go back to your question? I think everybody would agree even the White House, the Ukraine is on the verge of civil war because Ukraine might have been one state, but it was never one country. It was at least two. The West leaning toward Europe, 
uh, the East toward Russia. 